So overpriced and underserved. That's the topic of this week as we take a deep dive into development here in Brooklyn. And we thought we'd shed some light on an issue that is very important, but you may be a little confused by uh, what a community land trust is. So we're going to kick off this week with a potential solution. So Brooklyn overpriced and underserved community land trust. Let's see what this sausage is made of. So just what is a community land trust? This lovely infographic that we have here represents a housing block here. And this is the land, the actual earth under which buildings are made. When people in a community get together, the different stakeholders, and decide to form a nonprofit trust, they get this land and buy it, and then the building that is built on top belongs to that community land trust. It's leased out and developed by either a developer or other nonprofits, people of goodwill who get together and put some building on top of that land that has some useful purpose for the community. So that's the very base level of what a CLT is. We're going to let you know about CLTs in the United States. There are over 200 of them across the nation, as you can see, represented by this map. You might happen to notice there's a high concentration in the Northeast where we sit, which is very interesting. Over 150,000 affordable units of housing across the nation happen to be holdings of CLTs across 46 states and the District of Columbia. But if we take a little bit of a deeper look here in New York City, there are 21 CLTs across the state, but only one in New York City, which happens to be in a very nice neighborhood, if you may, in Cooper uh, Square, their community land trust there in Manhattan. Now, at the height of the foreclosure crisis, community land trust homeowners were 10 times less likely to lose their homes to foreclosure which means this is a pretty good model if you looked at what happened nationally. CLT homeowners make, on average, 60 to 65 percent of the area median income, which happens to be about $54,000 a year for a family of four. And in Cooper Square, the average income is actually $12,000 a year for those folks who are residing there. So not a bad deal and a possible solution. So that's just a little taste of what a community land trust does. We'll dive into it a little bit more in the A Block. All right, so overpriced and underserved, our A Block certainly fits that bill. For many Brooklynites, the rent is, yes, too damn high. So damn high, they're being priced out of neighborhoods they've called home for decades. Real estate speculation and gentrification are displacing residents across all five boroughs in a fight over increasingly valuable land. But many housing organizations in Brooklyn are imagining another way, a way for residents to control their land through what Brian just described for us. Well, can a community land trust give residents much more of a say in what their neighborhoods look like and who can afford to live there? Joining us from two such organizations are Melanie Berkowitz, a project associate at UHAB. That's the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board. Welcome to BKLive. Thank you. We're also happy to welcome Christy Peel, the executive director of the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Great to have you here. Thanks. And rounding out our threesome and to tell us about community land trust and how they might fit in with the city's ambitious housing plan is David Quart. He's the deputy commissioner of strategy, research, and communications at New York City's Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Welcome to all of you. David, why don't we start with you? We just heard a lot of kind of the detailed specs of what goes into one of these things, but what's, what's the big idea behind a community land trust? Well, I think the big idea here and something that we've really been focusing in on over the last year or so as we talk to a whole number of community groups across the city um, is to try to explore what for New York and for HPD uh, a new model uh, of something we're always looking to broaden our tools broaden the ways that we can reach households who are in need of affordable housing. Um, as you know, we have the overarching theme behind this is, as you said, rising rents, unaffordable rents in Brooklyn and right. every borough. And so the mayor's Housing New York plan is committed to preserving and creating 200,000 units of affordable housing over 10 years. We've already financed over 62,500 units in the first three years ahead of schedule. Um, and we do that with a whole range of programs and financing tools and different organizations from not-for-profits to for 
for-profits to MWBEs and all of that. Um, but one of the things that we've said, and this fits right into that, is a new model, new models. We're always looking at creative ways to achieve affordability, achieve extended affordability, pres preservation of affordability. And so community land trusts, um, as you said in the, in the opening segment, is potentially a way where community organizations that know their communities very well could have a potential to own the land and partner with HPD in the city through our programs and figure out ways to create and extend and preserve affordability. So in steps the community land trust. I think we're all pretty aware of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the potential for a CLT in a place like a Brooklyn where gentrification is running rampant? Well, um, UHAB is actually in the process of creating a, a CLT in the Ridgewood Bushwick area. Okay. And in general, we see CLTs um, as really creating permanent affordability. You know, what, what, what makes a CLT different than other kinds of uh, housing programs is that the subsidy is really, um, when, you know, if HPD were to give a subsidy to provide tax abatements and just, and to help developers create a community land trust project, mm -hmm. that subsidy will be there in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. You're taking the land and you're removing it from the private real estate market. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really in need of that in places like Brooklyn. And um, CLTs create uh, leases with the people who reside in their, um, in their buildings for 99 years. Right. And so we're really talking um, a span yeah, of generation and generational affordability. Um, so that's the one thing I see CLTs really really doing for you know Brooklyn and, and New York City and all five boroughs. The other thing is uh, stewardship of land. It's one thing to create a program, but it's another thing to really um, make sure that the, um, that the residents are engaged mm -hmm. in these projects, that community voices, not just the residents who live in the buildings, but neighbors who are affected by all uh, the changing, all, right? all, all of that in a community land trust. Yeah. Um, the governance requires that all these different stakeholders are actually at the table um, and are making those decisions. So before we go any further, I just wanted to know, like, what's the pitch? What are you, what are you in Bushwick and Ridgewood mm -hmm. saying to people trying to bring this down to the human level of right. where you live about? See, you're going to own this land, but you're not going to own the land. But for 99 years, it's mm -hmm. going to be in perpetuity. And it's like a generational thing. Like, how do you explain to everyday people why this is something they should be involved with? People want stability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, CLTs, you know, I want you to live um, in your a house or home or co-op affordably. Um, we want you to own. We don't want you to just be renters. We know um, the benefits that ownership offers. Um, but we also want to make sure that for families, while we want you to have the benefit if, of um, some profit if you sell your home, we want to make sure that some of that um, resale is also kept in the neighborhood. Gotcha. Mm. Christy, you like this pitch? Right. We love it. I mean, we want, um, you know, our mission at the center is to promote and protect affordable home ownership, and so the idea is to pay it forward, right? Mm. So we're really lucky in that we have a um, mayor with a visionary, you know, 200,000 unit uh, housing plan, but uh, we want to preserve every opportunity for affordable home ownership within that plan, not just for today, but for the future, right? So it's not just for the family that, that gets the opportunity. Right. Uh, to, to access that, um, you know, stable, subsidized housing today, but a future family can also buy. And the, uh, the CLT allows for that uh, underlying ownership to keep the subsidy in the property, so it's not just dependent on, on the, um, you know, what we call the regulatory agreement. Okay. So normally a subsidized housing project might be um, kept affordable by, you know, a 30, 40 year term, but because the CLT will own the land, when that term is up, there's the opportunity to have the CLT step in and make sure it still stays affordable. Cool. Right. And Christy, how are you making sure that you're getting the right people? What sorts of regulations are written into the plan for well, that? Well, really, it's, it's just another tool for HPD to take what it's doing that works really well and, and, um, and, and keep it there for the next generation, right? So it's, it's preserving the options into the future. Uh, and again, you know, we don't know uh, what's coming down the pike in mm -hmm. terms of federal funding. We don't know what's going to happen with future leadership. So we're saying, look, we're investing money in these projects now um, for both rental and affordable home ownership. So let's make sure that those resources are kept in the projects mm -hmm. right. and they're reinvested in the future. Uh, so it's, it's 
all about preservation. Right. Yeah. Right. It's about, you know, it, and knowing what, where we are now with gentrification, thinking, gosh, if we had done this 20 right. years ago, right. we would have a lot more affordable housing. So Exactly. So are there bit. things like um, income limits or are there um, restrictions on, you, you have to have been living in the neighborhood already for X amount of time. How, how are you regulating that? It's entirely consistent with mm -hmm. whatever program is in place, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a, um, an ownership structure that keeps the the land owned by a nonprofit with the type of governance that Melanie talked about, mm -hmm. uh, but it would work with whatever um, financing structure or you know income eligibility that's in place with the project okay. uh, based on HPD's uh, financing. So the idea is to think about ways in which the CLT ownership structure could complement um, the existing programs that HPD uh, has on the street right now to allow for future affordability that are already trying to preserve the right. neighborhood. So it doesn't have to be you know the CLT in and of itself doesn't determine a certain income level, right? It's just that sort of community put in place, mm -hmm. you know, that community voice put in place so that when um, the, you know, the programs might expire, there's a way to say, all right, we want this still to be affordable. Let's keep it affordable for the future. Well, speaking of community voices, I think if you lived in Brooklyn for five minutes, you're familiar with an RFP, you know, sort of <laughs> a request for proposals. But this, this was a new one for me in the course of the research. Yes. Uh, their HPDs issued a request for expressions of interest. Yes. Now, this this was a new one for me, so it's like going steady Before. versus we're yeah. dating versus we putting a ring a on it. Yet. Yes, so <laughs> what, what are you hoping to get from these uh, expressions of interest even? Well, it's a, it's a good analogy, actually. I think um, generally, <laughs> right, so you, everyone's familiar with the request for proposal, and that's generally a procurement where we're looking for a specific proposal, usually for a specific piece of property right. or sets it's of properties. In, okay. It's very something. concrete. Yeah. Here, because we've had a number of conversations uh, with folks like Christy and Melanie and other groups mm -hmm. around the city around what they want to see in community land trust, we've, we've heard different things. We've heard everything from the home ownership models that Christy's talking about, but also folks who are interested in doing this under a rental model. Um, of course, all of this has to work within the HPD programs and as part of our financing, because as Christy said, CLTs just by and in and of themselves right. don't create permanent affordability. They have to work with the tools that we have. So we issued what we call a request for expressions of interest, which is basically saying, we need to understand more about what everyone across the city has in mind. Mm -hmm. What type, what would you put in place? What type of structure? What type of model? How would you see the financing work from your end? And I think it might vary by geography, by type of organization. Uh, and as you said, in New York City, there's only one right now established CLT. Why is that? Is there yeah, anything why? about, like we know that New York is to real estate what Texas is to oil. Is there some particular thing that prevents more than one CLT in our bounds? Why has it been so difficult yeah, what here is or just about? so rare? I don't think there's any specific reason why not. I think w one thing I would say is that you know at HPD we have a very robust set of tools and programs that achieve many of the same things uh, in terms of home ownership, extended affordability. Mm -hmm. We recently passed the mandatory inclusionary housing program that requires permanent affordability on projects where there's an upzoning. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that we've been doing and continue to do. Right. Um, and we work with different types of organizations, not-for-profits um, that are there to ensure sound management and ensure affordability. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that said, the crisis continues. We're facing major challenges. And yeah. so uh, you know, over this last year, there seems to have been, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys speak yeah, to Christy, it more. Like why CLTs yeah, like, now? In our two question. minutes left, right. yeah. why so, CLTs uh, now? It's a, it's a great tool to combat gentrification, mm -hmm. and I think that in the past we've thought about um, community development as a way to incentivize investment, and this is a great way to preserve affordability. So yeah. we've just been trying to expand the number of tools in our toolbox that can help preserve opportunity. Uh, and I think that um, in the past, you know, some affordable home ownership on the market, you know, working families could make it work. And we've just seen uh, prices get more and more unaffordable. Yeah. So, I mean, there are not a lot of tools out there um, to combat gentrification from a home ownership perspective, but a CLT is one of them. Uh, and so I, I think um, we've just seized upon it and really are trying to put the pedal to the metal uh, and, and get it. Um, get it going fast before we lose every single last affordable opportunity yeah. in the city. Right. So can we give our last minute to Melanie to encourage people in Bushwick and yes. Ridgewood to get, get out involved. and be CLTers? Yeah, um, like everyone has said, um, we really have a limited amount of time. Um, and I think- What is the time frame? What are you looking at? And just in general, you know, with, with um, the rate of gotcha. you know, speculation and predatory lending and just we're losing um, 
options for affordability. And um, the thing about CLTs is, is it really requires neighborhood participation. And so um, for those of you neighborhoods that are already organized, um, nonprofit organizations that work with neighborhoods and housing organizations, um, learn about this model. Mm. It's a little technical, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people that can help translate it. And, um, and hopefully, you know, with the city's, um, city's sort of uh, interest, mm -hmm. right. and maybe more, right. um, yeah. Though there should be a lot of opportunities coming you can up in the future. actually learn more, Christy, in our, in our last few seconds. Tell us about the screening that's happening. There's a movie night. On March yes. 15th. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we're showing a movie called Arc of Justice, uh, which is about one of the first CLTs that was formed down in Georgia. It's going to be at the new school, and um, we'll make sure you have the exact information, but it's on the 15th, and it's a great way to learn about the history of the CLT movement and, and to think a little bit more about how we can. Um, Bring it here. We can do it here. Yeah, the New York way, right? Todd may have come. <laughs> Thank you so much. We Thank appreciate you. Thank you so being much here. for joining us. Thank you for having Thank us. You.